Hey guys, it's Amber. Welcome back. I am positively tickled pink to watercolor this flamingo from Colorado Craft Company. It's big, it's bold, so let's get started. This is the tickled pink flamingo from Colorado Craft Company, and it's a six by six stamp set. It's from their Big and Bold series, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. I love it. I really love big stamp sets because I find they're much easier for me to watercolor or copa color. There's more room for color blends, and so I'm really excited to color this up. So I am stamping this with obsidian pigment ink on a piece of Saunders Waterford high white cold press watercolor paper. I have it cut into a slimline design, which is three and a half by eight and a half. Those are the dimensions that I use. I don't think there's any really hard and fast rules on what size a slimline card should be. It just has to fit in one of those business size envelopes. So I've gone ahead and stamped this um, floral arrangement again on a piece of post-it tape here. And, and that's so that I can create a mask. I wanted to have a full bloom down at the bottom. And when you turn it upside down and stamp it in the opposite direction, they kind of lock together perfectly this particular arrangement. It really comes together beautifully. So you've got that same mask and I've just trimmed a little bit off of the top so that I can also stamp the flamingo. Now I did stamp all of these images twice because this is a textured paper. You're gonna to need to stamp it more than once, so I highly recommend using a stamp positioner such as the Misty that I'm using. So I'm using the Alta New Artist Watercolor 24 Pan set today, and I've dropped in a drop of water into each one of the pans to rehydrate the pans. I am taking out some Tea Party here, and I'm gonna use just one color, the Tea Party, to start with for my first layer, and then I'll mix up a new color and bring that in for the second layer so that there's depth of color. You can see that I have a photo reference off to the side because although I know that flamingos are pink, that's about all I know. I don't know what their beaks look like. So, so not only is the photo reference gonna give me information on what the beak looks like, it's gonna give me information on what colors to use and then also where my shadows go. So um, I highly recommend using a photo reference. So I've basically covered the flamingo in clean, clear water, and now I'm dropping in this tea party. Now, a note about my brush. Normally I use a much larger brush, and this is a huge stamp set, so I have no idea why I'm using a six round. It would be a lot more appropriate to use a 10 round or a 12 round for this image, um, and it wouldn't take so long to color. It, it truly is a mystery to me why I'm using a six round. I, I rarely use the six round. So um, definitely highly recommend a larger brush for a project like this. I do like the Wonder Forest brushes. Those are from Dana Fox. And that is because her 10 and her 12, well, all of the brushes come to a sharp point, but the 10 and the 12 especially have a really fine sharp point. Um, which allows you to use a lot of pigment and a lot of water and also get into tight areas. So I have my first layer here. So here you can see I've sped things up. So I'm putting down clean, clear water, and then I'm going to drop in the pigment. Not only do I have my photo reference for an idea of where the shadows should be, the artist has also provided some of these hash marks here to give you an indication where the feathers are and where some shadowing might be. As my first layer dries, I'm gonna move on to the beak here. And so I've mixed a different color. I've mixed warm and cozy with some Tea Party, which is gonna give me more of a salmon color. So I filled in the beak with clean, clear water and then dropped in a diluted um, amount of that salmon color. Again, referencing my photo so that I have an idea of how dark should that be. So now you can see my flamingo is super pink compared to the salmon colored beak. So I'm gonna come in with my second layer. And so again, this is the warm and cozy and tea party mixed together. And I'm bringing in kind of more of a full pigment into those shadowed areas. And then I'm gonna clean off my brush with clean, clear water, make sure that it's only damp and I will soften those edges and kind of draw that color out into my highlight areas. So here you can see I have just a damp brush. 
Now that is a little bit of the advantage to using a smaller brush. The smaller brushes don't hold as much water, so you're less likely to create a bloom in your project, whereas, which is where if you bring too much water to your watercolor project, it will create a watermark. So it will create a white drop. It'll kind of bleach out the paper, similar to if you spray water onto like a, a distressed ink ink smush panel, it's gonna bleach out the, the paper and cause a white spot. That's what bringing too much water to your watercolor project will do. So working with a smaller brush can make that a little bit easier. So it's really personal preference whether or not you like the larger brush or smaller brush. Totally up to you. So you can see that the color of the flamingo is changing, but because I have those that pink layer underneath, this adds more depth to the flamingo and adds different shades of color, which I find to be a little more interesting than just having the one layer of color. Watercolor, copa coloring, pretty much all types of coloring, color penciling, it's all about the layers, you guys. So. For me, I don't ever feel like a piece is really finished if there's just one layer of color. I recently did a color pencil project and I must have put on like four layers of color. I only color pencil a couple times a year because it is so time consuming. Watercolor, I feel like you can do several layers pretty quickly. For the beak, I'm using Rock Collection, which is basically just a gray, and I started with a light diluted um, gray, and then I'm bringing in darker pigment as I go. I do end up bringing this gray too far up the beak, and so I wet it and remove some of that gray, and I don't have that on film. You're gonna see, you're gonna kinda see the gray shadow of it, though. So here it looks okay, but I bring it up too far. I would recommend keeping a little bit of a highlight in there as I continued with this beak and kind of overworking it, I lost a little bit of that highlight, but that highlight is going to help add separation between the top and the bottom part of the beak. There you can kind of see the shadow of the gray that I lifted off. For these wider leaves, I'm using a mixture of green hills and green meadows, and then for the more spiky leaves like you see here, I'm using just the green meadows, which is the darker green. It has a little bit more of a blue tint to it. I do like to use different greens for different types of leaves. For the hibiscus, I'm using pocket full of sunshine and in the middle, I'm adding some tea party to it to kind of just bring all the colors together. And then for these other flowers, I'm using a diluted down tea party and I'll use red cosmos to darken up the centers. I try and limit the color palette so there's not just a cacophony of just color all over the place. Like I didn't want to introduce purples and blues to this per se. I wanted to kind of keep things pretty similar with the color palette. I wanted to make sure that the eye popped out a little bit. So I'm mixing up pocket full of sunshine and a little bit of that green hills to just brighten up the area around the eye. Now on the color photo, that was more of a light yellow color, but I didn't feel like that would show up enough. I decided to add a background, which is always risky. So I'm just using some cool summer nights and that was a color that was already mixed on my palette. And I'm just kind of wetting the surface first, adding in some diluted blue, and then I'll darken it up as I go along. I'm not going to add a complete background. I do end up fading it to white as I come up the paper. And so to do that, you wanna make sure that you keep the leading edge of the area that you're watercoloring wet. Now here in this corner, it's super easy because the stamped image kind of cuts off that section into its own section. It's the area that I'm doing now where you're gonna to wanna to fade to white and keep that leading edge wet so that you can keep blending it out. This is another time where using a large brush would have benefited me, so I highly recommend that. It would have been a lot easier to add that clean, clear water to the paper and get the paper nice and wet before adding the color. Plus a larger brush is gonna hold more pigment as well, so you're able to take it up the paper and um, easier to create that ombre effect or blend out to white. So. 
Here's where you can see I'm working to keep that topmost edge of my watercolor wet so that I can continue to blend that color out. So as long as I keep that wet, I can keep adding darker color to the base and pulling it up the page. If it dries, I'm gonna have a harsh edge there. Now I wanted to pop the flamingo forward. So I'm taking just a regular household pencil and a tortillon or paper stump. I'm adding just a little bit of graphite to the paper and I'm blending that out with the tortillon. This is gonna add just a touch of a chop shadow. It's important not to outline the entire image. You just kind of want to put it in those nooks and crannies and blend it out. If you outline the entire thing or you use too much graphite, you run the risk of just making the image look dirty um, and it's not gonna look as crisp anymore. You're gonna lose some of your detail and the whole piece is just gonna look kind of drab and dirty. Here I wanted to darken up some of the lines, some of the stamp lines. Um, didn't stamp fully because of the texture of paper. Now, the risk you run with this, or what I run into, is once I outline or go over a small part with a fine liner, I kind of want to do the whole thing. So here I'm channeling my inner Kelly Latavola and I'm going to end up outlining the majority of this image. I don't do all of the flowers, but I do outline the perimeter of each of the flowers. I do that off camera. And this just helps to darken up that uh, stamped image and just make it appear more crisp. Of course, once I did all that, my sentiments were looking a little bare, so I just added a drop shadow to those with the pencil and tortillon. And if you look at my beak here, one of the things that I did off camera is I used some white watercolor paint and a little bit of that rock collection gray and added touches that to the top of the beak. And I'm sorry I didn't have that on camera. Here I'm just adding some finishing touches with some shadowing kind of around the eye area, up the shadow areas, and just adding just a touch more dimension to the flamingo. It just... You'd be surprised, a little bit of graphite pencil goes a long way into adding some dimension. And you know where the flowers overlap the neck here, I wanted to have some deeper shadow there. And I do add just a little bit around the flowers. But this is what I mean, you guys. Once you start this, you kind of wanna put little touches of it everywhere so that things look complete. So that's a fair warning, shade at your own risk. Then I decided I wanted to add some shimmer, so I just picked a shimmer spritz and I sprayed it about five times from probably 10 inches away to make sure it was a fine mist and there weren't any heavy drops. Here you can see the finished product here and I just love how it turned out. You can see that little gray and white detail right underneath the eye and at the top of the beak, a little bit of the shimmer there. I want to send huge thanks to Colorado Craft Company for sending this stamp set to me. I had so much fun watercoloring it and I hope that you guys enjoyed seeing the process as well and hopefully learned some tips and tricks like using a larger brush to make things easier. As always, all of the supplies will be listed down below for you. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, liking, and ringing that bell so you don't miss any new inspiration. Here's a couple more videos for you before you leave, and I'll see you real soon.